<laughs> ah, I wanted to try something different for once. And it would have been my very first, maybe even the last one, I don't know, you can maybe let me know in the comments, split personality review, where I wanted to let you know what the nitpicker thinks, but what I think, which in this case actually was something different. But I just couldn't keep this act going through the whole time, just because I revert back to my old reviewing style. But it would have fit this review so well since the Sony Xperia X it frees a phone that is loved by so many people out there but also hated by so many and this kind of both sides of the coin thing would have been quite interesting but yeah I don't know but I will try to do it but if you want some more details and more some specifics actually watch my in-depth preview where I go into a few things that you maybe won't hear here in this review because this is more to be a uh, hard contrast things of things that are good on this phone and things that I definitely get why people might hate it for. Okay, so let's get into the first thing and let's already start with the hated part being for because what I read so much about people not liking the design with these huge bezels. I mean, what the nitpicker thinks is actually that it's nice that the phone is narrow but he doesn't like the fact that this phone is so tall with a weird center of gravity and always being afraid that the phone doesn't flip over. I mean, that's not great. Also with the curve, we have some glare, even though quite not a lot of distortion, which is good to see. But then there is still the fingerprint reader and the power button that we just have to knock off half a point. Even though some might like it and I'm personally getting kind of used to it because if I pick it up, I know where to grip it. But in most situations, what I actually do is I push at this place where I think it should be and that just swipes downwards and that usually works out very well for me. The fingerprint reader on its own is on a good level but nothing special, it works reliable enough. But it as well as the power button positions are just not what most people expect and I definitely get why they don't like it just as much as the curves and so on. But here is where I personally come in. I mean I agree that the ergonomics are not great but what I definitely can tell you is that the phone feels amazing in hand and yes it's quite heavy but it has this luxurious premium feel okay maybe the buttons not so much with a little bit of a more mushy feedback and yes it will attract a lot of fingerprints even though i think it's quite grippy i like the in hand feel absolutely and the build quality is top there is nothing really creaky even though i have to mention the fact that the glass doesn't seem to properly align here it feels to lap over a bit but that's that. I'm not going over whole the, the whole rest because I've talked about that in the preview. So we can just talk about the port, parts like, for example, that we have a notification LED, which is objectively just a good thing. And we also don't have a notch, despite what my wallpaper maybe might say, because that's more of a joke because so many devices have it these days. No notch, but yeah, they're for big bezels. Okay, let's get into one thing that is also a little bit controversial and I actually made a 15 minute long video about the display and what my opinion is on it and I think how good it is. No, not even the nitpicker has anything to really complain here about because what is really nice, we have the standard mode, which actually is really accurate. And this is amongst the most accurate and most natural OLED displays because everyone always says OLED displays are always oversaturated. They don't have to be. That's just something that most brands prefer to do. We can change the white balance. Video image enhancement is definitely something I would leave off because it just looks too cartoonish. Side sense, I tried to use it, but I just didn't like it so much with the weird gestures and so on. So that's not something super great. But objectively seen, I still think it's an absolutely great display. And I will, yes, I will give it five gold stars, despite what I've mentioned in my review that this display might have a gray whale, not the animal, but the whale, not quite sure if it's any different in sort of pronunciation. But if you don't use a super low brightness, anything below 45%, which some people say, I want that. And some people say, why would I ever go below 40%? I mean, I personally use it at 40%, which is the same brightness that I use on any other phone. And then this display is so nice and vibrant, especially with the high resolution. It's super sharp, great viewing angles, and it's just pretty much the best display that I can think of because compared for example to the Samsung phones there is not really any even distortion on the curves just a little bit of a diminishing of the brightness which is absolutely normal but this display is absolutely beautiful now what I've heard though is auto modus brightness seems to be usually on the lower side and once this display gets lower than 30 percent it looks a little bit more dull but I said this in my review every display if it's LCD if it's OLED if you lower it low, um, low enough, it will look dull anyways, because that's the purpose of a display, dimming down. And obviously it won't shine as much anymore. So I don't get quite why so many people have an issue. And I personally, after one week, don't see this to be an issue at all. Beautiful display. 
can't do it much better. So, speaker. Okay, I guess the second song actually makes the nitpicker's opinion a little bit more obvious. The sound is still a little bit tinny, a little bit on the sharper side. But then I have to say that finally the volume is loud enough. And obviously we still have front-facing stereo speakers, which is a good thing to have. So this now is amongst the louder phones. And it sounds good. I mean, it could be richer. And I already used some tweaks on the software, but it didn't really help so much. So... Maybe the quality is not the best, but it's stereo, it's facing towards you, you don't have to reflect or anything, and it sounds finally loud enough. So I am fully pleased, actually a little bit more than that by now, which is a big plus in my book. What is not though the case for the non-existent, at least not by default, in the device, headphone jack. I gave the XA2 four stars, but I will give this three and a half, even though I, say, I think this quality is the same. I think I just raised my standards, because this headphone jack volume, through the dongle is just not loud enough. I mean, quality, people always told me that that's the great thing about it. It's maybe not so super loud, but I don't even get that because the sound actually by by default with the test that I usually do sound a little bit more muffled and less detailed than some other ones. And it's just not really loud. I mean, it will be good enough for a normal, not all that really demanding in-ear, but for a really good in-ear, a little bit more demanding one or a headphone. I just don't think that will cut it. And actually one comment in my preview, agreed with me 100%. Okay, performance wise, can the nitpicker complain? Well, the nitpicker could point out one thing that there is an occasional but super rare little bit of a slowdown. But that's pretty much where it ends. Because I don't know, maybe they will have to still optimize. And as you can see that now it actually happened on camera. That was nice to see because it really barely ever happens. And obviously it did still load the site and so on. But every now and again, you see this. But it doesn't change the fact that this is an 845 phone. Sony optimized very well. Maybe not quite perfect just yet, but it's smooth. Multitasking works fast. It's snappy. It's responsive. It's good. Nothing else to say. I mean, I tried some overheating tests and so on, and I have to say this. It will throttle in games. Like pretty much every phone will do. It's just a matter of time when which phone will do it. So this is no... No worse, than, no worse or better than other phones. And just keep in mind that even throttled, you should still be able to play all the games without any issues. So still a top perform, absolutely on par with the very best ones out there. No doubt about that. Battery life. Now let's get first to the charge. With the default charger, which is just one the half amps, which is definitely something that a nitpicker can complain about. With two hours and 45, that's slow. I mean... What I personally see, which is nice to have, is an option that it charges slower, which it obviously with the slow charger will do anyways. It will put less stress on the battery. And if I, for example, charge overnight, it's not an issue for me if it just takes an hour longer. But for example, someone in the comments told me it's supposed to be an emergency thing that you can top up your battery faster. But you don't have the option on Sony. You don't have a charger that really charges faster in the box. You have to get it on your own. And if the person that actually commented as well told me, and that is right, that they don't use quick charge free, but they use power delivery over USB-C, which they actually don't even offer on own charger yet, it makes things even harder. Because I tried my power delivery charger from my laptop and it definitely charged faster. I didn't really check the time though. But that's not the way it should work because give me the option, give me a fast enough charger and then if I want to use the option to preserve battery life and the battery a little bit put less stress on it, I charge slow, that is fine. But give me the option if I need it to charge just faster, that's just what I'm saying. Other than that, 10% of an hour of YouTube is good. I think that's definitely benefiting from the OLED display compared to the IPS in the past. The battery isn't the best one in terms of size, but I have to say it's also not actually as bad as I expected it to be. And here I have to give you two stats this time. With the always on display on intelligent active or whatever it's called, smart active or smart on, and with it being off, because that will give you an advantage or a benefit of about 30 minutes, at least about that in terms of screen on time. And this is my value. About five hours, a little bit maybe over that on Wi-Fi. And on mobile data with about seven hours on Wi-Fi. Now with always on off, 
I would expect a little bit over five and a half, possibly even to six hours. Let's be moderate in let's say five and a half hours, which is after all like an half hour better, yeah, than what I expected in my preview when I said I expected to get five hours and seven hours. So if you turn off always on, you will get at least five and a half, at least seven and a half, at least with my usage, with my reception, everything else, which is, yeah, still a difference of about one strong, a little bit more hour compared to the XA2, which obviously only had a 1080p display and so on and so forth. Same battery size and yeah, efficiency. Someone told me if, for example, Sony screwed up and they didn't get battery life right, then they should be called out for that. But I don't really see anything wrong here because with about five and a half hours, it's on par with most other phones like the OnePlus 6 and so on. So they didn't really screw up anything. I mean, always on is what I always usually turn off to get the best battery life results for my tests, but I always also try it with on and yeah. But therefore, standby drain, really solid and I think I've talked long enough about the battery. So let's get into the software part. Okay, so as I mentioned before already, yeah, this is not really a notch, this is just a wallpaper, just a little bit of a joke, but let's check the software. And here we get obviously the draw with the side swipe, we get the Google feed, we get the option, which is quite nice to see, to change the icons, the icon size, you can also change the grid layout, which is quite a handy thing and it definitely gives you a more capable launcher than many others do. Now, what I also thought we would get is a new design, a new Sony one, but it seems to be just normal stock Android. At least that's what I've seen on Pixel devices. Other than that, this is already running Android Pie, which is nice to see. But once you enter the settings already, you can see that this looks pretty much like any other Sam uh, Sony phone with obviously the settings here which are some additional ones, like for example, also the side sense mode that I'm not gonna go into just because I don't think it's anything really useful. Then for example, for sound, which I didn't hit, but this, we also get some extra functionality, like for example, audio settings, clear audio plus, nor normalizer, accessory settings and so on. And this is all nice, but the nitpicker would say, give me more options, change a little bit something else, but still at least, Definitely, that is what I would say, keep it with a stock Android experience because after all, it's still more of a themed stock Android, but a few more little settings, a little bit of some maybe useful tweaks would be nice. It doesn't have to be anything big, but that's just my opinion. But what is obviously a real benefit and an advantage of Sony phones is that you get long support. People have asked me for how long exactly. I can't really narrow it down to any specific number, but I've read in comments that they support certain devices already up for like three or four years. That is obviously longer than many brands do. And you also get your updates quicker because by the time you might see this review, the Sony XZ2 already might have Pi. So that is nice. Now let's talk about the camera software here and I have to get into one thing. People have always complained about the part that Superior Auto doesn't really deliver the best results. And then people always say, just use the manual mode and you will get great results. I mean, I think that shouldn't be a thing, but I'll let you know that I think the superior auto modes, now by now just the auto modes does a really good job. But what I would actually like to see, and that is a little bit of a complaint here once again, is why does video not offer me the same manual controls? Because what I, what I can do beforehand, before I press the record button, change the warmth or the color temperature and change the brightness. But I can't do this within the video and I can't do anything else. So that's something that's definitely not that great. But other than that, I've went over the software a little bit more detail already in my re in my preview. So if you wanna check some more settings, but I have to say the software did improve. It got a little more convenient to use, but there are still some smaller things that I don't really bother so much about, but that could be a thing. Now let's finally get into the quality. And here I have to say, yeah, the nitpicker doesn't really have much to nitpick on here because I mean, I think this is pretty much the very best you can get in terms of selfie cameras because it has autofocus and it works so well. It has face detection. And I mean, the, the details here are amazing. And yes, it might generally over sharpen a little bit, but it has, it has the details to back all this up. So I am pleased with this camera. Also in lower light situations, it's still a fantastic camera for selfies. I mean, mm. Especially here, for example, low light, this is still solid. You can use the flash and actually get still a good natural picture out of it, like for example, here as well. So outside, nice job. Here once again, I mean, look at this. This is, this is 
uncomplainable <laughs> if that's a word and also for example in low light this still works out really good what does not work out at all good is yeah the portrait mode i mean it makes so many mistakes here and i've said this already my failure rate is super high like 80 90 percent it always gets blurry because it makes a few pictures in a, in a, in a different time span and you just shake a little bit in that period. And, and no matter how much I try to stay steady, I barely got good shots. This one is okay. This one actually is overall okay in terms of bokeh, but it's just not a reliable bokeh, especially in terms of sharpness. Because for example, this picture, it's okay. Maybe not the perfect cutout here, but this already looks already blurry. And that's why I just can't say if you want to use it on a regular basis to use that. And here, for example, have the option, as you can see, to make the eyes bigger and to make the head a little bit bigger. But once again, yeah, the portrait mode doesn't work all that well. It just makes way too many issues, way too many flaws. Now, low light. I've read about so many people complaining it's just a 2.0 aperture. If I didn't maybe get that wrong, I don't really care because I said it has no OIS, so low light picks are bad. I mean, I don't really see this it's not the best because it sometimes takes blurry pictures and they are not the brightest one the less the least kind of grainy ones but i mean this results in my opinion at least with my steady hand are absolutely not an issue most cameras aren't still better if it's not maybe a huawei or a samsung also super low light this actually still looks solid especially with the flash it looks quite good compared to the other pics that i've did here as well yes obviously it gets more blurry and it gets better with the flash, which you should use in this scenario anyways. But this here, for example, this is still okay. Obviously, if you zoom in, you will see some grain or you will see some imperfections. But this is, in my opinion, still solid. Now, once outside with good lighting, I mean, the details, like I said, are absolutely there. And therefore, a little bit of over sharpening is not an issue from my standpoint. I absolutely love what the camera does. And yes, I know the nitpicker complained about the fact that you can't toggle on and off HDR or have a setting for auto HDR. Someone told me they use auto HDR in the normal mode anyways, and it does what it does. But I would wish for a little bit more control on my own because it seems to just say, if you use auto mode, I am the boss and I tell you what it will happen like. But then again, I have to say, that's my own standpoint. What it says is usually also right because all the pics that I shot are crisp, are contrasty, are sharp, are natural. And just like on the XA2, the colors on the Sony's are the most natural ones, most accurate ones of all the cameras outside, out, out there at the moment. And here, for example, this, this looks just as I would expect it to look. So many cameras add saturation, add something else to it. But this is, this is what it actually looked like in reality. And I can see this on my on my calibrated monitor this is absolutely top-notch now let's get into video if it wants to start what's going on <laughs> okay here we are and yeah ignore the glare a little bit i just had bad sun it was a weird angle but 4k looks nice and sharp it's quite nice actually with the normal standard um, steady shot I mean there is inter um, yeah interactive or steady active or something like that but that's only available in 1080p 30 where you lose a lot of quality and that's why I'm just gonna show you the 4k sample because the quality the autofocus especially how subtle it is because as you can see here it slowly fades in but it always gets it right and it slowly fades out. Obviously, if you are in lower light situations, there I notice the autofocus not being as reliable. But other than that, I still think that the quality is absolutely top notch. I'm not going into the 1080p quality and so on because I just think that's not necessary. So let's get into the front ca front facing cam. And if you use that with intelligent active, I think for some reason autofocus worked a little bit more reliable. Because if not, I've noticed that even though there is autofocus going on, it's just not working so well and especially in low light I noticed that it seems to soften face facial features a little bit which is a little bit sad though what I have to say is great though we have stereo microphone a really high quality one so clean sound obviously if you are further away sound gets thinner but other than that the quality is greater and as you can see yeah I mean I think the quality of the video is absolutely great especially with intelligent active it's also nicely stabilized the crop is also good because it's not as close as many other ones and here is the next thing people sometimes ask me if it has camera 2 API support and yes it does 
But what I have used here, for example, is open camera. I've used the front facing camera with 4K 30 frames, which is not an option on the normal Sony app. And I bumped up the bitrate to 80 bit. So you can get a way higher quality, especially cleaner quality 4K, even though the difference isn't that big than you would even get with the normal software. You maybe don't get the stabilization, which is a drawback, but then, I mean, you can see it since this video is just 1080p60, the cam is absolutely ballers. So, I'm trying to keep this short this time and just tell you what the nitpicker doesn't like and what it would need for me to me uh, to be my daily driver. Make top and bottom bezel half as big as they are. So to shorten the device off so it's not super tall. Still improve the ergonomics. The buttons, I mean, I can get used to it, but it's still not something that I feel like it's natural to be used. Put them higher. But that's already actually pretty much it because the display, monster. The speaker's way more than good enough now. The performance, superb. The battery life is good enough. It's still a solid four stars device. Absolutely no issue. But yeah, maybe the Exit 2 got four and a half stars, but I mean, an hour less, you therefore get the way better display and the better speaker, but I'll get into that a little bit later on. The software now got a little bit better, but that will be the same case on the Exit 2 as well. And then we have the slightly improved, but not much camera overall, because it was already great on the Exit 2, but the camera is super strong throughout. Now, personally, not nitpicky. The in-hand feel makes up for a lot. The display, gorgeous. The speaker, finally loud enough. Performance is killer. Battery life is more than easily good enough for me because whenever I get solid five hours, then I'm super happy already. And I got that on this phone and even a little bit more with always on off. Software is now a little bit better than before, but not much. And the camera is already great. Okay, what you should though think about if you like portrait mode or if you like the bokeh mode a lot, that's just not what you will get here on this phone. The front facing cam can do it, but not really good. The main cam can't do it at all anymore from what I see because the Exit 2 had still this option to make it, but it didn't really actually work out that bad, but it's not really an option here anymore unless I missed it. So should you buy it or not? I mean, 800 is still quite a lot of money, but here's the thing. Sometimes you get extras on Sony phones when you buy them. Sometimes you don't, but obviously it will get cheaper. That's for sure. And now you might ask yourself, if I have already the Exit 2, or if I maybe think about getting the Exit 2, what's the trade-off? What's better? What's maybe worse? Okay, here's the way I see it. It feels a little bit better than the Exit 2. Ergonomics are pretty much just as bad. And yes, you have the curves now, which is a good or a bad thing, but it looks more elegant because the Exit 2 had still noticeably bigger bezels. You get... Even though the 1080p display, the LCD one on the X-Z2 was pretty much the best one you can get out there, this, due to the high resolution, in my opinion, is even better. The speaker is noticeably better. The performance is about the same. Better life, you will sacrifice at least one hour, if not a little bit more. Software is the same. And the camera is not quite as good, especially the front-facing cam here, for some reasons, feels amazing. So that's where it stands. Now... Obviously, there is a lot of competition out there. And yes, I call this the Samsung Galaxy Note 9 without an S Pen. And people just told me that's the S9. And yeah, I kind of have to agree. But that is a phone just because of its actually quite horrible battery life, especially on the normal S9, where this one is actually close in terms of size. I completely did not even think about because the S9, as great as a phone as it's, battery life is just not okay because this is like two hours more here on screen on time from what i had on the s9 and maybe at least one hour more than on the s9 plus so for me those two aren't an option if i want the very best of the best i need a note 9 but that's noticeably bigger than so if you want a smaller note 9 this is still the one that i would say as the person uh, as the real alternative obviously though price 800 wherefore at least now you can get already the note 9 for 750 here sometimes so it's actually cheaper but therefore you get longer update support you get faster updates you get some things that are maybe better but most cases yes the note 9 is still better so it's not quite a note 9 with <laughs> without the s pen but it's a damn well made phone but there is room for improvement i have to say though i like it a lot I can easily recommend it if that's a price range that you have no issues with at all. But if you have the Exit 2, I don't think it makes it up for it because you, you, you gain some things, but that's not a huge enough upgrade. And then there are other alternatives that you can just let me know in the comments, but I'm going to stop this now, okay? Bye.